1 Corinthians chapter 15, would you uh, turn with me, chapter 15, and we'll come together around God's word. I'm going to pray as we begin. Father, thanks so much for giving us a Bible that we haven't been left to make it on our own. Lord, by using our imagination, by using our feelings, God, thank you for sparing us. From these things that are so limited, so changeable, that leave us with no assurance. Father, I pray that we are spared from the error of the Corinthians. And Father, I pray that we stand, that we stand stronger than ever before. And Father, though in many places across our country and the world, Bible knowledge is slipping Father, I pray that you spare us from that, that because your word doesn't change, that our stand doesn't change either. We thank you for it. We thank you that on that cross, Jesus died for our sins, and from that tomb, he arose from the dead. And our salvation is as certain as the life that is in God today. Father, prepare us, I pray, to have a great ministry among one another and also those who are on the outside, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, now we call this the resurrection passage, and it is. But before it's the resurrection passage, it's the gospel passage. Because in the beginning opening lines of chapter 15, we have a statement, a comprehensive statement, of the very gospel message itself. But before we ever get to chapter 15, we need to go back into chapter 14 and set the context. I'll show you why we need to do that. Look with me, chapter 15, verse number 1. He says, moreover, brethren. The moreover says, I'm about to tell you something on top of what I've already told you. Do you see that? Moreover. Now, some people have said this is the first mention of a dog's name in Scripture. Do you see that? Moreover. But he's tying what he's about to say with something that he's already said. And I'll give you a choice to what he's about to tie to. Number one, he's going to tie to the gospel that he already has preached to these people. Okay, so he says, um, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached. So he, he already has preached the gospel to them, and now he's going to come back and declare that gospel to them again. Is that good? That would be very good because what I find, and I mean this very practically by observation, is that when you move away from the gospel, you need to continually touch base on that touchstone again. I've seen it with my own eyes, heard it with my own ears, that when people move away from the gospel and they go into deeper things, sometimes the deeper things can move them away from the gospel. But look, the deeper things are not the deeper things if you unhitch them from the gospel. Is that good? The other thing that maybe Paul is referring to that he's going to add on something to what has just been said is not the gospel, but it's the context in chapter 14. I think he's referring to both. I think he means both. Moreover, I've already taught you the gospel, but I'm going to declare it to you again. And moreover, I have been dealing with a problem among you and on top of the problem that I just explained for you, there's another problem that I need to discuss. So let's look back at chapter 14 and see what is this problem that Paul has just finished a discussion with these Corinthians about. Because clearly he has talked to them or heard from them in some way. He knows the state of their church. And he's dealing with these problems. And I want to tell you, I'm so glad that in, when I read these pages, I'm not Paul. I do help churches. 
sometimes in dealing through and finding a way and the hairballs that sometimes happen, but what a mess. What a mess the church at Corinth was in in their day. And I'm, I'm so glad that I don't have to sort all this out, that I can just stand here on a podium and show you what all Paul was having to deal with in this terrible nest of problems that existed in that church. It's a whole nest of problems, you'll see in just a moment. But really, I've given it a one-word description. And you'll find that out in time to come. All the way back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And let's read 6 through 9 and get a taste of the problem that they have. Verse number 6. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues... What shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by doctrine? So we need to define some terms here, because we could get lost in verse number 6, not knowing what these things are. He uses this phrase, if I come unto you, speaking with tongues. What is that? (laughs) Don't we all speak with our tongue? Well, this is glossolalia. This is... Speaking in an unknown tongue. So here we need to uh, put this in the hopper and translate it out. When, when he says speaking with tongues, he's referring to the practice of speaking in an unknown tongue, which means that God gifted certain people in the early church to speak a language that was not known to the speaker. Are you listening? So that someone who had never studied this particular language is by the gift of God speaking that language. So that those who have actually studied that language or been taught it will hear from God in their own language. Now, this is not gibberish. You'll see this in a minute. This is just not disconnected syllables else we could all speak in tongues, couldn't we? In fact, some have. But this is a known language. This is to speak in a known language, except the speaker doesn't know it. And that's why it's a gift of God. And this was in view here. But they're having some problems. Because their service has become a carnival. Because he says later that there are just multiple people speaking out. Could you imagine? Multiple people are speaking out in a tongue that is not known even by the speaker. Paul wants clarity. And you can't just turn a service into a bunch of people speaking unintelligible languages to most of the people. And so he's going to give them a way out of this problem. But clearly in verse number 6, he's saying if you do what you're doing, there's no profit in it. It would be more profitable if you're going to speak something out in your church service, there's a more profitable thing that you could speak. And he gives them three choices. Here they are. Speak by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying. Or by doctrine, okay, there are four. But the three all go together in that they are extra biblical. If you speak by revelation, it means God just gave me this on the spot and now it's coming out of my mouth. If you speak by knowledge, it means that God has given you a knowledge that is not available to these people except that he puts it in your mind and you speak it out of your mouth. Someone say, yeah, Freddie, my wife has that gift. (laughs) Or by prophesying. That is you, again, you are speaking something directly from God that you received and you're speaking it to other people. Now, can you see how that if that's what you had and that was all you had, you might in time come to a problem? Because how do you know How would you know if someone stands up from the crowd and says, blah, 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 
How do you know that God has spoken to that person to tell you blah, blah, blah? So that over time, if you've got a bunch of people saying blah, 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 and this person says blah, 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 how do you know which one is correct? And so there comes this need for discernment. You, you have to have somebody who knows what's going on. You, you have to have a judge. You have to have an arbiter. You, you need somebody who will be able to interpret and call what's true and what's not. Do you see how that could become a problem in the church? Problem, the chickens had come home to roost in this church worship service in Corinth. When you've got every Joe Blow in there, seems to be going off. Everybody has a psalm, a poem, a word, a, a word of knowledge, some prophecy. Somebody's going off in tongues and no one knows what's going on. And they're missing authority. And then he says, or by doctrine. Now doctrine in our day practically has become a cuss word in many places. People sort of eyes glaze over when you even use the word doctrine. What do we mean when we say doctrine? Is that a bad thing? No, it's a wonderful thing. Doctrine is the truth about God. Where do we get it? In the Word of God. Is that good? Is that good? You don't just spout something off about God and call that doctrine. No, no. Doctrine, true doctrine. Not the doctrines of men, but from the Word of God that's what we go by, amen? And so if you have a situation where everybody is just kind of going off and everybody's contributing what they think they ought to say, that could become a problem. Look at verse 23. He says, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? Is that what church is, that people come in? It's literally the word barbarian. Paul is saying, if you all keep doing what is going on here, uh, they're going to think you're crazy. So obviously Paul the Apostle wants to deal with that. Amen. Look back now in the context of verse 7, 8, and 9. Let's read these. He says, And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? So he goes to music to illustrate the need that there be clarity when we talk about truth. So he says in music, say someone is piping a song or they're playing a song on the harp. Except they give a distinction in the sounds. How shall it be known what is piped or harped? The notes give us distinctive sounds. Huh? And if someone misses a note, uh, it's not a good thing. It, it doesn't sound the correct message. It doesn't give a clear sound. Let me illustrate this with something familiar to you. Let's say it's time for the army bugler to blow the battle cry. If he gets mixed up in his own mind and blows jingle bells, instead, who's going to get ready to fight in a battle? Unless there's a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is spoken? That's what he says, verse 8. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. Now, in the immediate context, he's referring to the gift of speaking in glossolalia, an unknown tongue for the benefit of the early church. But over time, clearly, it had become a gift that's being abused. And someone, a lot of people apparently, are speaking out, and there's not a distinction. In the sounds. And a lot of people obviously are out there and they're like, 
What did he say? I have no idea. It's Greek to me. Now, they need to be speaking in the Greek, huh, in this context. But they were speaking wild languages from other places that some would understand, but many would not. And the many have come to think, are, are, are these people crazy? I don't understand what's going on. And that's what, ladies and gentlemen, we can't afford to have in the church. Amen? There's a lot of people going, I don't know what's going on here. So Paul is trying to deal with the problem of tongues. Now, look back one chapter, chapter 13, and look with me at verse number 8. Watch what Paul is doing here. Verse 8, charity never faileth. That is the agape love of God. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So he just took two of the things in verse 8 that he's going to refer to in chapter 14 in verse 6. And he says, these two things, you can use them now. In fact, they'll be better than speaking in an unknown tongue. But they are going away, and so are the tongues. There's one difference here in verse number 8 of chapter 13. And that is this. I want you to note um, on the prophecy statement, he says, prophecies, they shall fail. Look up here and let me illustrate this. When he says, they shall fail, picture that I have a ball, and the ball is rolling across the table. If the ball fails, it means that something acts on it. And the, the ball is stopped by the action that happened to it. So a ball is rolling across the table. It failed because I put my hand on the ball. And it has now stopped. The following phrase, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. You see, there's a different word used. Okay, a ball is rolling across the table and no one touches it. It just rolls until it stops. All the energy that was put into that ball has been expended and the ball has stopped. There's no longer any energy that carries that Bible forward. That's the word here. Now, prophecies, they're going to stop because someone puts a hand on them and stops it right there. The ball is going to continue to roll now until it rolls out of its energy and there it will stop of its own accord. And that's what will happen, Paul says, to tongues. But until it does, there are going to be some rules put in place. And that's what he does in chapter 14. Pick it up, verse number 24. Look at this problem expanded. He says, but if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. How is it then, brethren? In other words, what is really happening? Because it's not that. And now he describes what actually is happening among them. Verse 26, how is it then, brethren? When you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. He's after edifying. He's after the building up of people. Not that the people sit out there and they're confused. And they don't know what's going on around them. And they don't know what somebody just said. And that someone else in another part of the building spouts off. And neither language is understood. So here comes some clarity. Verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three. And that by course. And let one interpret. Do you see the order? This is order. He just said, rather than the carnival that's happening now, let's have order. Let everything be done for edifying. And so, two people can speak with tongues, or three. There's not four. Two or three, by course, that means one at a time, and someone will interpret there shall be no tongue speaking unless someone does know the language and speaks that they can interpret it in the common language 
so that everyone can understand. Is that good? Do you see the order that Paul is longing for here? Verse 28, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. And let him speak to himself and to God. What did he say? If you have been given the gift by God to speak in an unknown tongue to you that everyone else will understand to the, to the glory of God and the edification of the saints, then let that be interpreted so that everyone understands. But if there is not someone to interpret, keep your mouth shut. Is that what he said? Now I said it maybe a little more bluntly than Paul did, but you don't speak out something that's not going to be understood anyway. Just stay in your seat and stay quiet. Or just talk to God. Just whisper that to the Lord. And that way you can be edified though no one else is. Let the prophet speak two or three. And let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by. Let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one. That all may learn and all may be comforted. Do you see instability In the church at Corinth. If everyone is speaking out. And they say. I've got a word from the Lord. You be quiet. The person is to be quiet. Why would the Lord interrupt someone? Maybe because someone is speaking the wrong thing. That didn't come from the Lord. But do you see the potential for problems in the church? And so what we have is a lot of confusion. Look at verse 36. What? Whenever Paul, whenever Paul asks that question, he's going full teacher beast mode. What? Came the word of God out from you? Answer that question. No. He said, do you think you wrote the word of God? That you can just stand up and speak out something and everyone else is supposed to fall in line and say, oh, that came from God. I know. Did the word come from you? No, no, that's not how we got the word, is it? It didn't start in Corinth. And then he asked another question. Or came it unto you only? What's the answer to that question? Is Corinth the only place that God sent his word? So there's uh, evidence here, verse 36, that they also have a problem with pride. They've uplifted themselves to think, well, I get to tell everybody else the truth about God. Well, that's an interesting thought, but what's that based upon? And so you see, Paul says, look, you have one guy speak and then somebody else interpret it so that we have this correct and in order. Then somebody else can speak in a tongue, but let that be interpreted too. And if there's not an interpretation, be quiet. If you're speaking and someone else begins to speak, you stop and let there be order in the service. And let, the, let a prophet speak and let another prophet speak, but then someone else will judge whether what they said is true or not. Aren't you glad in my opening prayer I thank God for giving us a Bible? Amen? Because you, you don't just sit there and wait for me to say something and then rest assured that I told you the truth from God though you don't have it on record that I actually am speaking for God. But now what do we have now in this wonderful situation is that we have completed Bibles. And everyone gets a copy of it, amen? Some of you have nine or ten copies of it. You ought to do something about that because some people don't have any. But we have Bibles. And now when we sit under a teacher or a preacher, we hold a buddy. You put a finger on that verse and make sure that guy is saying what the author of Scripture said. Is that good? That good? But they didn't have that great benefit, so they're still going with plan A. But Paul has already said, look, plan A is going to change. We're going to get something better. We're going to have a plan B. It's coming. These temporary things are going to stop, whether God acts on them or whether they just give out of the juice that God put in them for a limited time. But we're coming to a better place. But until we do, let this order prevail in your church. Is that good? So here's the problem that they're having. Authority. There's your one word title. That's the problem with the church. Authority. They lack authority to speak completely. 
so that it can be known that what was spoken is from God. And that's led to these problems. Confusion, forgetfulness, and a loss of urgency. Look, if you went to church and you heard a message and you're not sure it came from God or not, how excited are you about going to lunch and telling someone at your lunch table what you just got from God? If you're not certain it came from God or from somewhere else. So the one problem, the, the, the lack of authority has caused confusion, forgetfulness, and loss of urgency. With that, we come to chapter 15 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren. What I'm telling you is, he's going to tell them now, I've already taught you the gospel, but I find it necessary to do it again. Or, and maybe and, he said, I just told you about one huge problem you have in your church, and now, moreover, I'm going to tell you about another problem in your church. I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now some of you see a problem here. I'm going to guess that some of you have seen a problem here before, and you sort of jump over verse 1 and 2 and start right in on verse 3. Because there's a bit of a problem in verse number 2. And let's see if we can have clarity on this. The problem is not in the verse. The problem is sometimes in our own understanding. Amen. You see the problem, don't you? Verse 2. Are we saved if we stand? That's the problem. Does it take standing before I know that I'm saved? We'll deal with that problem in just a moment. But first, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which I also have received. Look down at verse 3. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that, and he describes the content of his gospel, okay? But look at this word first in the first line of verse 3. Now, that word first means first in importance. We can't teach anything more important than the gospel, amen? But he also means this is the first thing that I taught you, hmm? Because shouldn't the most important thing be the first thing if you're in an urgent hurry to get a message across? This is first and important because this is eternal life. The gospel is how to get into eternal life. So Paul is saying the most important thing is the thing that I taught you first because nothing spiritual can happen until the gospel is received. Amen? We don't go and try and enroll people in Christian obedience school and five years later get around to the gospel, huh? So he starts with the gospel, he teaches that, and now he's coming back to it. Why? Why is he coming back? Well, number one, it's wise to continue touching that stone over and over again to remind people about the most important thing that all other spiritual truth connects with. Hmm? You, do you understand this? But there's another reason that you would come back and need to declare the gospel again. And that is that the very content of the gospel had become questionable to the people. What I'm telling you is this. Paul was led to believe that in this group of people that he refers to as brothers in verse 1. He has an idea that some of them are waggling, waffling. The cheese has fallen off the cracker. Of some of them because they've begun to question something about the gospel. They're questioning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Moreover, I need to talk to you about another problem. It's that some of you are questioning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is a problem. That's a double problem. It's a worse problem than the problems... In chapter 14, because if we waffle on the content of the gospel, in what do we stand? 
We have nothing without the resurrection of Christ. So what does it mean then when he says, By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you. Does forgetfulness mean that we didn't really receive something to begin with? No. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not saved because we continue to stand in something. Here's why. Because salvation is given in a moment in time when a person believes the gospel. That moment is frozen in eternity. Because in that moment the person receives life from God. Question, what kind of life does the person receive? It's everlasting life. So everlasting life from that frozen moment in time when a person believed in Christ continues into the future. There is no cessation, there is no stopping by God of everlasting life, though the person might forget or become confused. But here's a mistake that some make. They read only verse 2. But verse 2 is coupled with verse 1. There's not one thing in view here. There are three things in view. Verse 1, near the end, he says, Which also ye have received, number 1, and wherein ye stand, number 2, by which also ye are saved, number 3. So there are three things that have happened to these people. When they had the gospel made available to them, they did three things. They received the message, they stood in the message, and they were saved by the message. It's those three things that are the question if they keep in memory. Middle line of verse 2. If they forget, they are still saved. That is, into eternal life. But if they forget what they learned, then they are not standing. Do you understand this? They have stood in the moment that they believed in Christ. But if they now have forgotten the truth of the resurrection, they are not now standing. And what they received before has been forgotten. Therefore, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. So the problem here is not that Paul has an idea that some of these have lost their salvation because they have forgotten something. Otherwise, he wouldn't call them brethren in the second verse, in verse uh, second word in verse 1. They are brothers. But the problem is that they are not keeping in memory the first message he gave to them. Therefore, they have a problem standing in the truth of the gospel. Because if you've forgotten the resurrection, if you no longer are believing in the resurrection, your standing is not very strong. That's the problem here. That's the thing that is lost to these believers. They are not standing in the gospel because they are playing games with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if you're playing games with a resurrection, if you're playing mental games, if you're doing word tricks in your mind and are not certain that Jesus rose from the dead, you are not standing in the truth of the gospel. That's the problem in Corinth. Some of them are playing around with their faith in the resurrection of Jesus, it doesn't mean that they are not saved. It means that they are not standing in the truth in which they have been saved. But now they are doing nothing because their faith has come to vanity. That's the word he uses here in verse 3. Watch the, uh, verse 2. Watch it. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, Unless you have believed in vain. The word in vain here is eke. And the word eke means nothing. It, it means a goose egg. It means zero. What's he saying? 
He's saying what you trusted in in the gospel that I taught you. What did he teach? He taught them that Jesus died on the cross to pay their sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day. He also taught them about the witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that was the message they had believed. Amen. Do you see this? The only message they had was the message Paul brought to them. So he says, I'm going to tell you my message again. Let's review this. It's that Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is what I brought to you. No one else had. I brought it to you. You believe that. You received it, you stood in it, and you were saved by it. But now, now, you're foggy in your memory, so I need to bring it up again. It's about the death of Christ on the cross and His resurrection after He paid for your sin. But if you are losing this in your memory, then you believed into vanity, into nothing. Listen, this word, A.K., it means that the benefit of your faith in Christ that you had before is now zero. You're doing nothing because of your faith. Why? Because you're questioning the very elements that you formerly believed in. Wherever a teacher comes to realize that the effect of his gospel preaching is zero. Eke. When he realizes all that preaching I did, all the investment that I made into these people has come to AK. That's when he gets an AK heart. An achy, breaky heart. To realize it's having no effect on how they're carrying forward because they're questioning the very elements of what I taught them before. For I delivered unto you, verse 3, first of all, that which I also received. Paul wasn't winging it when he preached the gospel. He gave them what he received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now if you had to show the scriptures how that Christ died for our sins, where would you go? If you're in Corinth. Now today, I know, you'd probably go to the Gospel of John. You'd go give some Romans. You'd break open Ephesians. You'd go to Galatians. He had none of them. Where would you go? I know where I'd go. I'll tell you in a minute. Verse 4, And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. I'm going to begin in Isaiah 52 while you turn there and read some background for you. He says, Isaiah 52, verse 7, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Verse 9, Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. Verse 10. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Here's Isaiah 600 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Speaking about how they ought to sing because they received the good news of how God has come to save. Is that good? Is that good? And now in verse 53, the prophet Isaiah, that would have been available, highly available to Paul the Apostle when he went into Corinth to deliver to them, first of all, that which he also had received. Is that good? Is that good? Here's what we receive from the old prophet Isaiah who got it from God. Verse 4, Isaiah 53, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. Who's he talking about? There's only one person in the history of earth that Isaiah could be given the prophecy of the coming of Jesus Christ. From verse 4 all the way to verse number 8, he's speaking of the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This is the element 
of the gospel that Jesus died on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures. Amen. Pick it up with me. Verse 7. Watch this substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Here comes his burial, verse 9. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Here comes the resurrection of Jesus Christ, verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Did you see the line? He shall see his seed. How do you die on a cross to pay for other people's sins and see your seed? That is, those who come after you. You could only do that if you were raised from the dead. And then this great phrase, he shall prolong his days. If you die on a cross as a sacrificial lamb, how in the world could you have your days prolonged past that point of death on the cross? Only in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm not showing you today that Paul taught the book of Isaiah 53 to the Corinthian church. I'm just saying there's something possible to him. And if that's where he went, buddy, he painted the correct picture of Jesus dying on a cross according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. From whence does the gospel come? From God and not man. How then can a man receive that from God? God makes it known in his word. We're not going by feelings. We're not going by logic. We can't go by dreams or visions or any of that. Or else we come to confusion and we come to forgetfulness and we come to a loss of urgency because we don't know if that message came from God or not. Maybe it came to God today because I feel really good. Maybe tomorrow I won't feel so good. Maybe I had to get decaf coffee and today I'm just not feeling it. So I got nothing from God. No, no. The gospel is not given to us on such flippant terms as that. God gave it to us. In the scriptures. Is that good? Is that good? Look with me. Galatians and chapter 1. Galatians and chapter 1. Here's another place where Paul gives us words that we can be confident in that the gospel we have is the true gospel. Galatians and chapter 1. And look with me at verse number 11. He says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul got the gospel. God took him after his faith in Christ. God took him into the desert at Arabia. Spent two years in the desert as God confirmed to him the truth of the gospel. Therefore, we have Paul who can so blatantly call on the Galatian troublemakers and say to them, you are under a curse from God because you're preaching a gospel that's different than the one that I preached. He can be so confident. This is not cockiness. This is not arrogance on Paul's part. This is simply that Paul knew where he got the gospel. From God. And not from man. Therefore, someone else who comes along and preaches a different gospel. Didn't get that one from God. And it's rejected by God. And put under a double curse in Galatians chapter 1. Now the Corinthians are having problems. And someone is even toying with the idea, maybe Jesus didn't raise from the dead. I'm hearing that down at the marketplace. I don't know. Paul is saying, you better know. Because if you don't know about the resurrection, you're not standing in the gospel. Because the gospel is the message of the resurrection of Jesus. Listen, let me say this and say it clearly. The gospel is not true 
because I believe it. The gospel is not true because we believe it. What kind of arrogance would that be? Anyone in the world, in any cult in the world, could say the same thing. It's true because I believe it. No, it's not. The gospel is true because God said it. Amen? And if I'm saying what He said, then I can say, I got the gospel. But it's not true because I believe it. We just need to find what's true that came from God and believe in that. And we'll have the right gospel and we'll be confident of whatever we tell another person then we are standing for God's gospel and not our own. There's a major player in the church in in North America. A few months ago he was asked a question. No, I'm not going to tell you who it is. You can look it up if you want, but I don't want to make this about him. But a person interviewed him and said, okay, if you're the evangelical pope, you're in charge of the church in America, what do you do? Here's the answer. That he spoke to leaders of the church across America. Here's what he said. Are you ready? You should write it down. Take the spotlight off the Bible. That's what he said. This morning... That church is probably talked about more than any other church in America. That church. Pastored by a man who said, if I were the Pope, if I were ultimately in charge of what happens, here's what I'm going to do. Take the spotlight off the Bible. Now let me summarize for you what I understand his case to be. We're living in a postmodern age, post-Christian. People don't believe the Bible. Therefore, we need to come at it in another direction. We don't have another direction. There's not another direction. There's not another source. There's not another place that we can get the gospel. If they don't believe the Bible, we can't help them. Because the gospel is in the Bible. Once we throw the Bible away, if we can, as he said, take the spotlight off the Bible, where do we shine it? On my personality? And unfortunately, in many places, that's exactly where the church light is shining. On the dynamic personality of a speaker. The latest poster boy for the Christian faith. But there's no such thing, Paul the Apostle says. It's either the gospel of the Bible Or it's another gospel that's under a curse from God. Thank God that He gave us the Bible that we can judge the gospel. Ladies and gentlemen, all over our country, a false gospel is being preached. Because it's not according to the scripture. It came from a different direction. But we don't have anything else to establish the truth. 